of the digital world. The common thread across our organization is that all of IHMC's research is human-centered. In other words, making sure that digital technology is designed and implemented in such a way that it helps the human being achieve results that would otherwise be impossible. IHMC is a not-for-profit computer research institution with multiple facilities across Florida, each housing some of the top scientists this multidisciplinary think tank allows for researchers from different domains to successfully collaborate without the normal red tape that accompanies most academic research. IHMC's first steps were taken in Pensacola, Florida, at the University of West Florida campus in the early 1990s. The early years of IHMC's work pioneered and laid the foundation for how humans interface with computer systems today. From the first online college class, innovative knowledge sharing applications, advanced cockpit displays for pilots, to the natural language processing frameworks that all intelligent devices such as Siri, Alexa, and Google rely upon. One of these research initiatives, CMAP Tools, is currently utilized by millions of people around the world and is incorporated in thousands of schools in nearly every country. The software allows for the user to easily construct a knowledge model consisting of key concepts of any given topic. The relationships of these concepts are easily conveyed by the addition of linking phrases. CMAP Tools is widely accepted as the most powerful tool available for educational institutions wishing to convey conceptual knowledge to their students. With continued funding, IHMC has been able to regularly update CMAP Tools to work on most devices and web browsers. CMAP Tools, in all its forms, remains free to download and utilize, ensuring that this extremely powerful software is available to all. Long before the proliferation of mobile electronic devices, IHMC researchers were developing the foundational framework to set up ad hoc networks, which allow secure and instant communication grids to be established wherever the need arises. These tools offer the first responders to an earthquake or hurricane-affected region the best chance to establish and coordinate relief work in an effective manner. Another area that we are addressing is the fundamental research on autonomous vehicle behavior. With self-driving cars right around the corner, many basic questions on how the vehicles should be able to function separately and as a group are still misunderstood. We hope to solve many of the basic behavioral questions to allow the next phase of driving technology to be safely implemented. Hmm. IHMC's early pioneering work in AI expanded quickly into physical systems, such as tactile vest for pilots, surgical robot assistive interfaces, advanced driving feedback devices, and technology to restore vision to the blind. Our vestibular research continues in areas such as pilot situation awareness and exploring the relationship between the visual and vestibular systems. This research promises to answer many of the impending medical questions and issues related to the oncoming wave of virtual reality devices. Our robotic hardware production began with the design of multiple wheeled systems. These platforms allowed researchers to develop real-time balancing algorithms, which would ultimately lead to our work with Lego robots. IHMC's earlier experience in cockpit control systems led to our work with operator interfaces for UAV pilots, which served as a template for the current IHMC operator interface. We also began our autonomous path planning work during this period while working with quadruped robots. In response to the 2011 Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, the United States Department of Defense issued a call to the robotics community in order to advance humanoid robotic systems into the realm of usability. The DARPA Robotics Challenge was a four-year global initiative that allowed IHMC to combine every aspect of our robotics research and compete against the top robotic institutions in the world. Winning two out of the three phases and finishing second in the finals secured IHMC's reputation in the robotics community and our innovative operator interface and robotics are now open source software utilized by a majority of the bipedal robotics community. We have continued our humanoid work with NASA's Valkyrie and the Boston Dynamics Atlas robotic platform. 
IHMC's work over the last decade in assistive technology has led to the development of a series of passive and active robotic exoskeletons to provide mobility to those who have lost lower body functionality. Our passive devices utilize a series of linkages and springs that store and release energy at specific times in the leg swing and were designed specifically for multiple rehabilitation scenarios. Our powered exoskeletons deliver lower body functionality to those suffering from paraplegia and have undergone extensive redesigns for each iteration. Our first exoskeleton was powered at the hips and knees and served as an important test bed for multiple user interface approaches. Our second exoskeleton was a collaboration with NASA Johnson Space Center named X1 and was designed as a multi-use device not only for paraplegic mobility on Earth, <coughs> but for exercise in zero gravity environments as well. Our third exoskeleton named MENA V2 was powered at the hips, knees, and ankles, and was controlled by an onboard computer and crutch interface. This device allowed us to compete in the first annual Cyber Olympics held in Zurich, Switzerland. Future iterations of our paraplegic exoskeleton will focus on enabling real world increasing the speed of the device and incorporating balance algorithms developed during our work with humanoid robots. Our X1 exoskeleton work with NASA was the first in a series of devices designed to increase human performance in able bodied individuals as the end goal. The Grasshopper was a result of our second collaboration with Johnson Space Center and served as a demonstration platform for the feasibility of designing a powered exercise device to use in zero gravity situations, such as the International Space Station. Our latest device is not limited to a single exercise and is easily configured to multiple exercises. Even though we designed these devices for astronauts in deep space, we believe that our programmable exercise devices due to their ability to collect real-time data and provide precise weight loads at all times, could revolutionize rehabilitation procedures, programs, and ultimately increase the effectiveness of personalized treatment worldwide. IHMC's researchers are also leveraging our knowledge and expertise base while focusing on all aspects of human enhancement from ketone esters, blood flow restriction training, to extreme environment performance. This research initiative is rapidly progressing and we expect some exciting discoveries on this front. Understanding the Earth and the impact of our civilization on the planet is the goal for every environmental scientist. ITMC is currently working to develop unmanned tools that can be deployed to collect and gather real-time data over long periods without the need for scientist intervention. These tools show incredible promise in aiding our ability to preserve as much of the natural world as possible while coexisting as a thriving population. As the world's cyber infrastructure grows at an unprecedented rate, so too do our security demands. Protecting vital systems from cyber criminals is a massive undertaking for any cyber analyst. IHMC is developing tools to allow cyber analysts to visually monitor data in an unprecedented way. This research is enabling network analysts to visually scan incoming network traffic to determine if there is a cyber attack underway and empowering Food and Drug Administration inspectors to look for patterns and identify criminals tampering with or hiding incoming food shipments. IHMC's Ocala facility serves as a hub for our work in natural language processing. Natural language processing is at the core of most computer systems today. By empowering the user to speak to the computer, we can seamlessly integrate intelligent systems to aid a number of tasks. One possibility we are exploring is the ability for a computer to analyze voice data over a long period of time to try and detect a number of neurological conditions, such as Alzheimer's, brain cancer, and dementia, long before they are diagnosable by a doctor via traditional testing procedures. We realize that the researchers of tomorrow's world are beginning their journey today. Since the beginning, IHMC has pioneered multiple avenues of community outreach 
aimed at introducing foundational scientific concepts to local youth, regardless of their social or economic status. Programs such as Science Saturdays, Tech Connect, Boys and Girls Club, Robotics Open House, high school and college internships, and summer robotics camps allow IHMC researchers to plant the scientific seeds necessary to grow the next generation of technical innovators. For nearly three decades, IHMC has focused on solving problems that lay beyond the horizon. By keeping the human at the center of all of our research initiatives, IHMC's researchers devote their lives to optimizing all areas of technology to ensure that the human is not forgotten. From restoring vision to the blind, mobility to those who have lost it, or empowering users to achieve things not thought possible in our lifetimes, the researchers at the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition are fully exploring the boundaries of where technology and humanity meet. This is kind of your next stop, and then um, once you're finished here, you'll, there's, you'll go out this back door here. I'll direct you. So you guys can hang out here, look at the stuff around here if you want, and keep looking. Mind who, who's running this thing is, is going to be coming over. But okay. <laughs> so we'll, we'll give you the demo. Okay. Robot, maybe plastic, um, just so we can test how things move, do things that we like, how it's made, find out mistakes before we make it in okay. metal or carbon. Mm -hmm. and then, that's, exactly. like a, that's a previous exactly. version of the robot um, with like a full entire, you know human style body mm -hmm. um, and this is like a newer version of our hip and our leg and you have like a lot of ranges of motion you can really come and play with it mm -hmm. um, and then you know how do we get these things to move like we do um, we have a bunch of different ideas in terms of like really simple mechanisms um, things like you know, to move up and down or same thing mm -hmm. You can come and play with these um, as we're just walking through. Um, and they're really fun. So, you know, some of them are a little more complex as well. Mm -hmm. And iterating on these, we have an actual uh, carbon mock up leg. Um, actually, Victor laid this up. And then we have a 3D printed knee part, like your kneecap, um, when I carbon fiber, whatever that is. So. Mm -hmm. And these are the this is the actuator that actually goes and is going to move all these. We're going to have three on the top, two on the bottom. Mm -hmm. The same with this. This is just these are all just physical, um, interactable uh, prototypes that we use and other people use. Just be, uh, with this one specifically, like be careful with don't put your fingers. Gotcha. try and build all of these so we find out intuitively what we think of it instead of just looking at a computer screen and saying is it a good design or not try to understand physically moving it do we like it do we not like it things that we've done yeah oh yeah we cut it we cut it yeah Side we had to cut um, like the knee. Maybe you didn't like it. It's a 3D printed. Um, it's all the plastics 3D printed. Yeah. I mean, it's just an easier way to, yeah, like it. Um, to make this out of. It took them like three days to make it out of carbon. 
is the other easiest way. And then you were, I don't think the machine makes it. Yeah. Without paying that money. So I'm gyroscopic effects because it's, it's turning a, it's turning around. It's softball? What we got here is yeah, your the, the elliptical runner. I got with, uh, the no, that actually oh, moves his leg, okay. legs back and forth. I'm sorry. Can you see the gray? Chris will be giving you giving you a demo of how it runs. You can see it over here. So you can see it in real life. This 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 little robot doesn't have any sensors on board. It's just one motor that drives the mechanism. Everything else is mechanical design. The, the way the to make it run without falling over. So Chris only has a throttle, yep. and uh, he'll run the treadmill. It goes up to about 10 miles an hour. Uh, is, is the max speed of this treadmill. Yep, so it's all off the shelf. Uh, radio, radio controlled parts, which are not cooperating very well. We'll try running it anyway. Um, but yeah, you, yeah, it's a, Um, <laughs> always put performance anxiety here, huh? even robots get nervous. And, uh, well, the cool thing about this is that we kind of figured out the, the forward running is, is pretty stable. We don't have to control much, uh, which means we don't have to make really complex sensors and feedback controllers to have it run. Um, the challenge is, like as you can see, this treadmill has two sheets of glass on the side. Um, the stability from side to side is something we haven't completely figured out yet. Um, so right now, if you want to have it be stable from left to right, we'd have to build a controller and sensors for it. Um, we're trying to develop something that does that on its own without control. Okay, well, let's see if it works. Going up to 10 miles an hour. So what's the benefit of my pedal instead of for pedal? Well, uh, yeah. well, let him take a rest. The, in in a general, the uh, <laughs> being able to send on two legs instead of four mm -hmm. means you'll be able to go through narrower openings. Mm -hmm. So for example, like like a humanoid robot, like as a human, you're able to go through a really so really narrow narrow thing. More flexible. It's, it's more flexible. Player. It's more yeah. versatile. Okay. Um, and each each system has their own strength. Yeah, uh, like a, a quadrupedal robot is it's more, more stable, more stable, which yeah. is also more it's suitable bigger. for, for yeah. uh, carrying big loads uh -huh. over, over rough terrain, for example. Whereas this might be pretty useful for for speed. If you combine mm -hmm. what we learn from these kind of systems with a robot like mm -hmm. uh, a humanoid, yeah, we might be able to make it like a fast running humanoid. Yeah, <laughs> maybe which would be a very, okay. very, yeah. very, very, very. We developed mm -hmm. initially for NASA. 
for astronauts to exercise either in space or on uh, Mars or the moon. It does exercise providing resistance with motors. So you can see here that one of the actuators is moving the weight, but in the same way that it would, if it were powered on, it would take resistance to move it. So you basically pushing against it and exercising. And we think on Earth that you can provide a smarter exercise system by eliminating the weight and using motors. Cool, so, yeah, that is a drone. Fetch me a cold one. What? Fetch me a cold one. <laughs> I can't do much more than this. Yeah. Spy on you. Yeah. Cool beans. Anything else you want to add? Uh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. And this, the hopper. Yeah, so that's what we named our exercise device when we first started out. It's gotten mm -hmm. a few different names over the years, um, but we still call it, originally the whole program is called Hopper. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah.
that's good. Okay, good. This is what they would be seeing. So even though the sphere is turning, it looks like the sphere is kind of going one way and then going the other way and going one way and then the other way. And that's because I'm speeding up and slowing down how fast they're turning at the same time. And so while they're inside, they can get very disoriented. And we can make them under controlled conditions disoriented, all to the point of being sick. We don't normally want to do that. But what we can do is use that as a way to try to find out why some people get car sick or seasick or motion sick, air sick is really one of the big ones that we're interested in for uh, pilots, because there's a lot of pilots that come through uh, that choose military aviation as a career, so they probably don't get seasick or car sick. You know, you wouldn't say, I want to fly jets if I get sick every time I go to grandma's house, right? Uh, but they get in the aircraft and they get air sick. And so there's something different. I work over the Navy hospital, yeah. So. yeah, so you probably are familiar with people, you know. Yeah, and I know down in the, uh, in the uh, old ER base, there's a bunch of old testing equipment that used to be over at the Naval Air Space Medical Research Lab. Uh, and that's where I used to work a long time ago. But this is actually uh, a Defense Department project that was uh, that built this. But the goal here is to be able to generate, in control conditions, things that cause air sickness or other kinds of motion sickness. And then once we figure out what is causing it for a particular individual, look at ways that we can mitigate it. And, uh, and one of the ways to mitigate it is desensitization. So if you've ever been out on a cruise, you might get a little bit queasy. First day or so you're on the cruise, but by the end of the cruise, you're fine because you've accommodated and you've adapted to the moving boat and the fact that not everything's exactly right. I was right. actually find it like when you get off. Then yeah, then you have to reverse. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, so you got, you got your, uh, your, your, your wobbly getting back out of the car. And that's because, again, you have to readapt. Uh -huh. So, but if you were to just be wheeled out to your car in a wheelchair and then drove home and then you got out, you would not have been recovered because you would have not had any stimulus yet to get you recovered. So the goal so here is that... So, so your brain has to be calibrated. Exactly, now. yeah. And it has to see what happens when I do this. When I take a step, mm -hmm. oh, the world doesn't change. All mm -hmm. right, so I don't have to compensate for it. And then mm -hmm. you go back to that other set of reflexes. And so our goal here would be to be able to desensitize somebody uh, who may be potentially uh, suffering from air sickness, but do it in a very precision fashion, as opposed to just giving them, here's what we do now in the Navy, is give them uh, a list of 20 exercises to do, where they move their head and do this, mm -hmm. and all kinds of other stuff. Probably, you know, three quarters or 80% of that has no effect on them. But the ones that do make them sick. So they tend to not do those ones. 
you know, and I said, well, I'm doing, you know, 80% of what I was assigned, and I'm not getting better. Aversion therapy. Exactly, <laughs> right. So, but when you're in here, we can actually generate that stimulus, right. and we can give it to you at the right profile and the right uh, uh, number of cycles. And our goal is to not so just... Do you communicate with the person? Yeah, so we've got headsets, we talk to them over the, over the headset, uh, and they, you know, they can hear fine. And they, actually, it's a fiberglass. So if the headsets go out, we can just talk to them straight through it. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, you got to talk loud, you know. Um, and interestingly enough, that sphere is a, uh, it concentrates the audio in the middle. So they can hear us fine just talking. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't hear them very well. So they have to speak up if we want to hear them. But uh, uh, it actually amplifies outside sounds at the point where their head is. So are you taking like biometric? Yeah, so, so we do things like, like this is our EG headset that we use in there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this actually just goes on their head and we can pick up brainwave changes. And then we can also uh, use the sensors over here. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's that's actually recording from this headset, mm -hmm. and uh, and so then we look for changes in the in the brain waves. We have eye tracking as well. We got heart rate, uh, heart rate variability that we look at, and so all those together we can kind of get an estimate as to how much they're fighting to not grow up, is it essentially, and that way we can hopefully identify when they're getting better. Because we so somebody see, like me who likes roller coasters would yeah. probably do really well in that. Well, that's what's interesting. Is we may find something that, that is <laughs> triggering on you because so same thing with the with the with the, uh, with, the air, uh, with the aircraft pilots is that they if they got sick on roller coasters, I don't think they would say I want to fly jets for for the Navy, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and so there's something different about the experience in flight that is a combination of self motion, the aircraft maneuvering. And then the visual cues that you get from the clouds and the terrain mm -hmm. and things like that, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's really what this device is, is able this to is do. Other kind of simulator. So this is a different simulator that we use just for other applications, a, a dedicated flight simulator. And so uh, we look at uh, in this particular experiment trying to generate uh, different levels of workload and stress for the for the uh, boredom that sort of thing. So really long flights uh, simulated. Uh, giving them a lot of tasks to do at certain times and no tasks to do at other times and then looking at again the same sort of physiologic measures to try mm -hmm. to identify when somebody may be having changes in their brainwave patterns or other uh, uh, physiologic responses that correlate with uh, uh, performance drop-offs and then hopefully we can use that as a way to give them a gauge uh, something more like you know their engine or fuel consumption gauge you know anybody who plays you know video games you know it, it's you got your armor and your health and all that. We don't give those to the pilots, you know. You, mm -hmm. They got all that information about the about the aircraft. You don't have any of that about themselves. Mm -hmm. And so uh, mm -hmm. they can make choices better about what they might be able to do maneuver-wise if they knew what their reserve was. And that's really one of the mm -hmm. things that we're looking to try to get out of this experiment. That's interesting. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in. Sure. Thank you.